Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve Hernandez, and I am the executive director of the legislature's nonpartisan commission on women, children, seniors, equity, and opportunity. We are here today for a bit of a celebration. Uh, today, we are launching uh, officially our Stand Up and Speak Out Empathy and Connection Through the Arts initiative. A couple of years ago, Jill Nessie, a composer, producer, and writer, uh, approached the commission with an idea. She had written a song, and the song she hoped would help address the horrible issue of bullying that she was so well aware of because she had a young daughter who was in the school systems and she had a big heart. That started a journey with the commission uh, that led to this initiative called Empathy and Connection Through the Arts. We now, over the last couple of years, uh, have worked together with additional partners to create a set of tools that include uh, production, that include music, and that include enrichment activities for young people to access social and emotional skills building opportunity through the arts. We're really excited today to have quite a lineup of friends and guests that'll be joining us today, uh, not to mention young people who have participated not only in the showcasing of this work, but also uh, participated in the enrichment activities uh, that have been developed in partnership with organizations such as the Collaborative on Academic, Social and Emotional Learning out of Chicago, uh, the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, Central Connecticut State University, and other friends that you will get to see and meet today. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our first guest. Uh, he is a friend of the commission, uh, a special friend of the commission, member of the Castle Board of Directors, and uh, from the Urban Assembly, I now welcome David Adams, who will launch uh, and frame our conversation today. Welcome, David. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate being here today. So first, let me um, thank the Connecticut Commission on Women, Children, Seniors, and Equity for having me here today. I'm so excited to be able to launch this amazing effort on behalf of the state of Connecticut, um, connecting SEL and the arts. To engage in that topic a little, I'd, I'd like to tell you guys a, a quick story about the social and emotional dimensions of art and the impact it's made on me. My great uncle passed away in 2008, Dr. Earl Alexander. He was a psychiatrist, he lived in Brooklyn. And I remember his funeral well, I was 24, stoic as I approached his body, listening to his eulogy, comforting his daughter and his wife. Stoic that is until the closing hymn, it is well with my soul. While singing this hymn, my fortitude left me I felt the tears streaming down my face as the enormity of the loss resonated with each chord. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. These words and the music that accompanied them they did what rituals and incense could not. They grounded me in the feeling of the moment. And by doing so, connected me to the feelings of my relatives in the church at the time. But it did even more than that. It connected me to the pain of Horatio Spafford, a man who wrote that hymn over 121 years ago. In 1873, in response to the separate deaths of his four-year-old son during a fire and his four daughters at sea. Imagine the power of being able to connect people to each other and to yourself in one singular space. To say that art is grounded in the social and emotional is to understate the power of art to connect us to each other, to the artist. To achieve that amazing feat of transcending time to connect generations, to create culture. Art is what we create when we need to connect ourselves to the world and the world connects back with us. Let's talk about the social. Art and audience are intimately related. The gaze of the audience, the reaction, the synergy that occurs when the self and the social are fused into a singular shared experience. 
that connects our emotions to ourselves and to each other. To express emotion, share emotion, understand emotion. It's amazing that across cultures, time and space, we understand joy, sadness, the emotions expressed in works of art. Because art is what we create when we need to connect ourselves to the world and the world connects back with us. And what does this mean for social and emotional learning? Well, here at the Urban Assembly, we don't talk about implementing social and emotional learning programs. We talk about organizing schools and even society around the principles of social and emotional development to afford students with relevant experiences and purposeful instruction to develop the social and emotional competencies that impact their success in work, school, and life. And these experiences range from playing basketball to singing in chorus, to struggling through a math pro problem or writing a memoir. I remember a 10th grader reflect on what SEL taught her and she told me a story about hating memoirs because quote, I never liked to write about myself and I never felt like I had anything to say. But the work that we did at my school helped me know myself in a way that gave me confidence when it was time to express who I am, unquote. Self-awareness, recognizing who I am, what I need and how I feel relative to the world around me. Self-management, I can manage my behavior in pro-social ways. Social awareness, I care. I can demonstrate awareness of the role and value of others in our greater community. Social management, I will interact with others in meaningful and productive ways. Meaningful and productive ways. What is art if not about creating meaning in our lives, in our experiencing, experiences, and connecting each other to that meaning that we create? To hold the power to link a 24-year-old to the pain of a man living 121 years ago is truly the power to change the world. And that is the power of art, the artist, and the social and emotional experience we all seek to pursue. So on behalf of the Urban Assembly, I'm so excited to welcome you here today for the launch of a project that does just that. Connect us to our art and connect us to each other. Thank you for the invitation and I'm excited to kick this opportunity off with the stories of students who have done just that. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much, David. Such a, such a powerful dissertation on that relationship between the arts, connection, and empathy. You know, one of the things that was so clear when we first uh, experienced the first showcase at the Iverton Playhouse here in Connecticut was that young people were not just consumers of this work. They were engaging in this work. And what was so powerful about that is not only did they experience a connection with the people on the stage, which oftentimes were young people just a couple of years older than they were, but they were experiencing that joy and that connection with each other. And more importantly, they were turning to adults and empathizing with people who were on the stage, sympathizing in ways, and also expressing their own desire to talk, to share, and to express. And that's why very early on, one of the things that we did and committed to was that we would join with our universities and institutions that really have dug deep into the science of learning social and emotional skills and provide resources so that we had a way to ramp up to the experience of connection and empathy and then ramp down from the experience. Later on, we're gonna be talking to a school leader here in the state of Connecticut who, has, who is really uh, emblematic of what leadership can do to help make those connections, uh, that in a moment. But thank you again, David, and please stay with us throughout the experience. Now, I've, I'd like to turn now to our, um, the second part of our evening tonight, which is really a showcasing of the showcase. And I'm, I would like to welcome to our Brady Bunch screen, uh, Robin Fox and Eileen Melody, uh, two of our friends who are scholars and thinkers and teachers uh, in this work and empaths, if I may say. And uh, they are gonna be working with a group of young people on the work that they have done together under the, under the artistic guidance and, um, and inclusion of uh, Ms. Jill Nessie, who we'll speak to in a little bit. 
Uh, so now I hand the mic over to you, Robin and Eileen. Thank you so much, Stephen, and thank you everyone for being here. And David, uh, I listened to you last week and this week, and I can't wait to hear what you're gonna say next week. <laughs> um, appreciate it so much. The, uh, we're gonna start with a, a scene from the film um, because I think that let, let's uh, experience what we're talking about. And uh, some of the students who are here, some of the teams who are here are in the film. And when we're done, we're going to do some social and emotional learning exercises with them. Um, some from the activity guide that goes along with the film and others just to connect us in the moment. So I am going to assume the technology role here of showing a portion of that film. So please bear with me everyone as I set up the technology so you can enjoy about five minutes of uh, a scene from the film. We're ready for you. An idea. Hi, I'm Stephanie Lawrence, and I'll be singing the song. Somebody to 
not going to hurt you. It's me, Ian. From kindergarten? The bow tie. Your bow tie, Ian. The one that used to wear a bow tie to school every day? One and the same. Some things just never go out of style. What are you doing in my room? Don't worry. This is just a dream. It is? Yeah. Turn around. Sup? <gasps> okay, I believe you. It just seems so real. Why are you here? I know that you've had a tough go of it since starting up at Rockville High. I gotta say, the way Rhea and Phil treated you today, that was horrible. Today? That's every day for me. You know that has nothing to do with you, right? I know it seems like you're the only one they target, but trust me, you are not alone. If I'm not? Then why does it seem that way? I don't know what to do. I just can't go through this anymore. I understand how you feel. You do? I do. Believe me. Right now, it may seem like there's no way out. But not everything is always what it seems. What do you mean? It's exactly as it seems. Those two, along with their friends, are awful to me, and I never did anything to them. No. You didn't. And that's why I'm here. Come on. I have something I want you to see. So that's pretty amazing to, I mean, I was almost crying and I've seen this so many times. Thank you, Jill, for this amazing offering and all of you actors. Oh my God, just so wonderful. You're, you're um, I'm still a little emotional right now because it just is such an incredible thing to feel that feeling and have it resonate so deep within of, you know, my pain is different than your pain, but it's still pain. That emotional pain is still very real and, and you know we can't measure it and and we really can't share it but we experience it and when we see it like that it relieves something it relieves some of the suffering and I appreciate that so much um, so we're going to do some exercises with some of the students right now so I think we who's ever doing tech is going to get the kids back on or the students back on and um, hi everyone so good to see your faces. You might recognize some of these stars from what we just saw. <laughs> just really talented people. So we're going to start out, and, um, and everyone can join us. We're going to start out by letting all this settle in a little bit and doing a couple of breaths with a technique called breathing fingers. So we're just going to start out like this with our thumb to our index finger. And with every breath, we're gonna change fingers. I'm gonna do four breaths. And this is just a way of connecting us to our deeper selves, our, um, our wisdom, our calmness, and to do it together creates this beautiful sense of community. So just, you can close your eyes um, or just gaze a few feet in front of you. And all you have to do is listen to my words. You don't have to think. If you do think, Bring your awareness back to my voice. And first, just settle in. So get comfortable where you're, seat, where you're seated. And we're just going to check in a little bit. So see if you can put your awareness on your feet right now and actually feel your feet in your shoes. And then move your awareness up to your knees and your lower back, your shoulders, 
your right arm, your left arm, your neck, and release any tension that you might be feeling right now so that you can settle into your body. We're bringing our bodies with us right now. We leave them behind so much, especially on Zoom. So we're just gonna feel our bodies and let go of any tension in our jaw and our forehead, just let that go. And now just notice the breath coming in and out of your nose. It's cool on the intake and warm on the out breath. And everyone can do this with us. We're gonna breathe in for four, we're gonna hold it for two, and we're gonna breathe out for five to slow our whole system down. So here we go. Breathe in, two, three, four, and hold it. And breathe out, one, two, three, four, five. Switch fingers to your middle finger. And breathe in, two, three, four, and hold it. And breathe out, two, three, four, five. Switch to your ring finger. Breathe in, two, three, four. Hold it at the top and let it out slowly, two, three, four, five. Switch to your pinky finger and breathe in, two, three, four. Hold it at the top and then breathe out, two, three, four, five. Now just relax and let that settle in, all that nice slow breath. And when you're ready, open your eyes. Huh, so, just so good to see everybody here. We're gonna do a connecting exercise for everybody who is on the screen. Um, and this is called Rebel Rebel because you're gonna do the opposite of what I say. Let's practice a little bit. So if I say sway, let, we're gonna first do what I say, not do the opposite. So when I say sway, you sway side to side. So sway and stop. Sway and stop. Now when I say stop, you sway. When I say sway, you stop. Here we go, ready? Sway, stop. Sway, stop. Oh, yeah, here we go. Sometimes I get mixed up too. Okay, so that's pretty easy, right? So we're gonna do another one, which is, and this time do what I say, don't do the opposite. We're gonna touch our nose and then we're gonna pat our head. So touch your nose, pat your head. Touch your nose, pat your head. Okay, now do the opposite. Uh, pat your head, touch your nose. Pat your head, touch your nose. Okay, we're gonna combine this with the sway stop, gonna do the opposite of everything I say. This is waking up our, our neurotransmitters. It's really connecting us and we're, it's helping us focus and pay attention. And here we go, opposite everyone. Sway, stop, touch your nose, pat your head, stop, sway, touch your nose, pat your head. Excellent, wow, really, really good here, We're a good team. Um, I know that we just saw a, um, a video on, uh, oh, it was a film, on a, a girl being bullied and she's not alone, obviously. <laughs> and everybody has experienced some degree of bullying. We're gonna do an anonymous poll right now, right here in real time. And we're gonna launch the first poll and um, please uh, go ahead and answer it when it is launched. And we're gonna dive a little bit into empathy and kindness and the kinds of um, unintentional bullying and intentional bullying that might, might have. So um, if somebody teased you for something out of your control, you can hit the yes. Um, and if somebody teased you, didn't tease you in your life, you can hit no. So everybody answered and we're gonna end the poll and we're gonna share the results. And uh, so everyone who answered has been teased for something out of their control. 
So if you think about that for a second, you're just being you and, and people tease you. Um, let's do the second poll, please. Second poll. Um, you posted something mean by accident unintentionally or on purpose about somebody on social media. So yes or no. And we, um, excellent, okay. So we're gonna end the poll and we're gonna share the results. And um, so yeah, that happens. Sometimes you don't even realize the intention is uh, not to, it's just to have fun or to tease but um, it can be received very differently than you intend. Um, so I think we need poll number three. You heard someone make a joke about race, sexuality, or culture. And we're gonna end the poll and we are going to share the results. So uh, that's everyone here has um, heard someone make a joke. I know that uh, it's such an awkward thing to do when somebody makes a joke that is insensitive. And one of the things in the guide is helping students to learn how to stand up, to be an upstander, to, to voice in a, an assertive and yet calm way uh, of that that's, um, you know how to how to do that how to how to say this is this is unacceptable or this is hurtful and uh so that's part of what this poll is about we're gonna uh, do the uh the last poll here um oops there we go you heard someone nope that's we just did that one so i'm gonna so the last poll okay well well the last the last poll is that uh um, you wish that someone or here, someone here had is, stood up for you. It's up. Okay. So you wish that someone, uh, wish you had stood up for someone or someone had stood up for you. I have a feeling this is going to be pretty unanimous. And yeah. Yep. We're going to share the results on everyone. So learning to be an upstander instead of a bystander is a huge, huge thing that we can teach students there. There is strength in numbers and a lot of what a, um, someone who's an aggressor uh, gets entertainment out of, out of watching other people see the bullying too. So um, it's important to become an upstander. And um, we're gonna go on to the next exercise, uh, Eileen. Yeah, our next exercise. Um, hi, I'm Eileen. I'm a public school counselor, middle school counselor, and I work with students on this issue all the time. It's very near and dear to my heart to support students. Um, our next activity is about identifying emotions, which is the basis of any anyone who is empathetic can identify emotions. And so we're going to work on developing this skill by developing uh, people's uh, emotional vocabulary. So Robin will share with you a list of um, emotional words. Um, and I will ask you, so um, the group, let's all play this together. Okay, I'm going to give a phrase to you. Um, and I want you to repeat that phrase the way that I say it. You, everyone together, so you can all put your mics um, take yourself off mute. Um, I'm going to say the phrase, I can do that. And I'm going to say that phrase and you will repeat it back with a certain kind of emotion, okay? I can do that. I can do that. Do that. I can do that. Okay, let's try that one more time. I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. Robin, would you please show the emotional uh, vocabulary word list? Yes, I will. Sure it is. is that visible? Yes, it's visible. Okay. So 
what we're trying to do here is trying to identify what was the emotion I was conveying when I said, I can do that. And we will take anyone's ideas here. Do you want us to, sorry, do you want us to just talk or? Yeah, sure. Um, I think confidence. Okay. I agree with confidence as well. Great. Anyone else? Maybe empowered. Okay. Do we have anyone else who'd like to offer their ideas? I would say optimistic. Okay. <laughs> Maybe inspiring. Love it. Love it. Love the different range of um, emotions that you've uh, presented here. Um, yeah, I was going for being optimistic. I find that a really wonderful quality. So uh, was that Jake? You know what, it's, it's interesting because um, our, when we express emotions, they're usually layered. It's not usually one pure emotion that's coming across. And it's always more than words. It's not just the words we say, it's how we say it. It's the gestures, it's the intonation, it's the rhythm that we speak in. And all of that adds up to meaning and commun communication of emotions. And so the same words, uh, let's try that again with a different emotion. So um, does, does anybody want to say uh, the same line? I can do that with a very different emotion than that. And then we'll copy you. I know there's a lot of good improv actors on this screen, so. And even if you're not, you can please still uh, join us. So would somebody like to say, I can do that with a maybe opposite or different uh, emotion? I can try it. Okay, yay. <laughs> Thank you. I can do that. Okay, on three, let's all say it like that. One, two, three. I can, I can do, do that. that. All right. So let's put up the uh, emotion screen again. And we can uh, take try to figure out, well, what was in that emotion? Mm -hmm. the way that it was just said. So anybody have any ideas? You can call it out. I say calm. Calm. Mm -hmm. Did it seem as confident? Um, I think insecure. Maybe a little insecure. Any other shares? No, okay, so let's um, let's ask, it's, is it Lenaya? Lenaya. Lenaya, Lenaya, what were you, what were you going for? I was going for more of an insecure. I would agree with that. Yeah. Thank you for volunteering. No <laughs> problem. Um, I'd like to try another a word that we sometimes hear often. Um, it's um, sorry, the word sorry. Um, would someone be willing to think of an emotion or use one of the emotions from the emotion chart and say that word sorry with that kind of emotion. Sure, I'll do it. Okay, thanks Alexis. Mm -hmm. All right. Sorry. Okay. All right, let's repeat it back to her. Ready, here we go. Sorry. 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 So yep. what do you think the emotion was? Yeah. Do you need the chart again, people, or do you want to just feel it out this time? <laughs> Can you do it again, Alexis? Yeah. Sorry. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's packing a lot of emotion there. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me let me share the screen again, because I think it is, and this is why emotional words are really important for students to see, because it expands our ability to know the words and get into the nuances of words because it makes a difference. The words that um, might be uh, uh, you know, attributed to one uh, emotion are similar but not that similar to um, an emotion that might suggest something 
uh, different, even though it kind of sounds the same. So if that made sense. Yeah. <laughs> so any, any, uh, any words here st strike people as the ones that might be uh, what Alexis was feeling? I would say maybe around like annoyed. Okay. Uncaring. Okay. Yeah. So Alexis, what were you feeling? Annoyed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like, you know, a, a sorry cannot be a sorry. Right. And I love you can be a begging for somebody not to leave. You know? I mean, so it really is tuning in to other people by looking on purpose, listening on purpose and uh, listening uh, very, really carefully to the message behind the words. That exercise is called more than words. So, yeah. I mean, are we going to do one more or? I think we could try one more if the group is up for it. They seem to be um, interested in, in doing this and exploring some more emotions. So let's try another one. Um, I'm wondering, does someone have a suggestion on a phrase perhaps that, that you might use, a simple phrase? Well, we could, um, we could either do that or... Um, there's, we could, we could do the, I love you. I love you is really fun because it's so, you know, overused and so uh, interesting to say it in different ways. Uh, so uh, somebody want to say, I love you in a way that might be interesting. No. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll go. I'm always doing, I'm always up for it. So it's like, all right, here we go. I love you. On my count of three. One, two, three. I love, I love you. you. Whoa. All right. Did you feel the love? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And what was else was mixed in with that, you think? Fishing? Say it again. I couldn't hear that. Say it again. Desperation. Desperation. I yeah, there was a little bit of desperation going on in that. So, um, and part of the exercise also includes is setting up a bit of a scenario. Um, Robin, what might have happened? What line might have happened? Some dialogue could have occurred before you said that. Yeah, okay. So it might have been um um uh I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to go to the to the dance with you. Um sorry. I love you. Uh, so uh and then when we do this with students we also see if they could come up with a line after. So then what does that person say back to them? So what we're doing is we're diving into emotional scenarios in ways that teach the students about emotions, and then also give them this playful way to respond to each other. And uh, yeah, so. If I could reflect on that uh, just a little bit, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I learned in this work, and Mark Brackett reminds us over at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, is that emotions are data. And what's interesting is that when you express emotions, you are actually communicating. So uh, I'm, I'm experiencing the exercises that you're doing now. And it, this is hard work. It's mm -hmm. hard work to actually try to figure out intention, emotion, uh, what it is that you're actually communicating in a moment. And it's hard work for the conveyor, but it's also hard work for the listener. And that's why it's so important to see this as a skill, a developmental skill set that is so critical, not only uh, to get along on the day to day, but also to be able to function productively at work and to be able uh, to function productively uh, as an adult. And so many of us are lifelong learners when it comes to being able to emote and connect. And I count myself as one of them. So thank you so much for that, two of you. Please go right ahead. I just wanted to chime in. 
I think I think we're we're good. Just a, a snippet of what the types of things that um, you know for social emotional learning there. It, it really is a territory that the adults are entering into, as well as students, because we all are constantly growing and learning about ourselves, about our relationships, how to be um, how to be wholehearted in this world and be vulnerable, which is so hard because everything in this world tells us to protect, protect, protect. Don't, don't show your true self, you know, fit in. And yet those things, that protection and that fitting in also prevent us from thriving and growing. So it really is learning how to balance, you know, having really good boundaries because that is essential, but then living life in a way where you are accepting other people's ideas, where you learn to listen on purpose so that you're not thinking about what you want to say next. You know, you're really listening to the words of the other people. There's been articles in the New York Times, and this has been studied and researched that um, when we truly listen to another person without preparing what we want to say next, there is a communion that happens. There is, this is the way that we heal the differences in this world. We listen listen listening is a social emotional learning skill it can be taught so it's the importance of this work it goes beyond everything to such a um, you know global level of how how can we go forward in this life in our schools right now in 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 the streets right now everywhere we go if we can you know stop saying what we want to say and start listening, really listening behind the slogans, behind the uh, words that people are saying that they've learned from different organizations. And we listen to the pain because what a lot of it is pain behind all that. And they, people just need someone to listen. They need someone to hear us. And listening I, is the foundation of empathy. And I think that is one of the reasons we're here today is how do we develop the people's empathetic capacity. That's just an example of, one of that one exercise. It's one of my favorites. So we like to use it often with our, our groups and I certainly use it with my middle school students, um, developing their emotional vocabulary um, and developing um, empathetic uh, human beings is, is the goal of this work. So thank you all for participating with us. That was a lot of fun, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to you, Robin and Eileen, and to um, our young people who participated in the enrichment activity showcasing. It just gives you an example of how it is that we as members of a school community and even outside of the school community can work together to really explore uh, some of these concepts and get to know the words that are attached to the way that we feel and the feelings that are attached to the way that we relate. So thank you for that. You know, I want to turn now to the expression and artistry side of this, because, you know, I, I've said this to Jill Nessie, and welcome Jill Nessie, the artist, writer, and producer of, of Stand Up, and just so much of the work that we're showcasing today. Uh, so much of this work, Jill, is about the arts, and I am not shy when I say that uh, part of this initiative is to support the arts as a way of really allowing one more entry point into social and emotional skills building, but also expression, which is so critically important, uh, developmentally important, but also important for all of us at any given part of the day and in our lives. So I'd like to welcome our young people. Uh, if you could unmute yourselves because we're gonna have a conversation now and Jill as well. So let's start with you, Jill. Um, you know, you came to us a long time ago uh, with a song that you had written. Can you tell us a little bit about the motivation for you writing the song that you described, uh, her song, which you described as an anti-bullying song? Her song that um, I played for you that day that we met was called um, Stand Up and Speak Out. It was the original Stand Up and Speak Out song. And it was about a girl who people were um, treating horribly at school uh, and she um, left before her song was done. So it was a metaphor for that. She, she left her life because she was being bullied so badly. Um, and that's the first song that started. And from that came 14 other songs. Jill, you know, what's so powerful about your intention in creating this work 
is that uh, we have had one of the strongest anti-bullying laws in the country, uh, in the state of Connecticut. And over the years, the law has been refined. And what we found over the years was that one of the greatest motivations for our legislative leaders in ensuring that we had not only a strong law, uh, but also one that was responsive, one that uh, really drilled deeper on the skill set itself, the prevention skill sets, was, uh, was often because there had been a horrible situation that had happened in real life in one of our communities. Uh, we can think of them, suicide, self-harm, harm of others, all of those uh, indicators of despair that we see so many times. You know, we have joining us now on Facebook Live, we have young people who are watching, and I bet uh, when you young people were sharing uh, some of your experiences and some of the ways in which you were responding in the film and also in the showcase, uh, I bet it resonates with a lot of people. I'd like to start in the order in which I see you. Uh, Brooklyn, you know, this experience of being in this play uh, can be very emotional. Uh, but it can also be very uplifting. Tell us a little bit about your experience. Which role did you play um, in, in the production? Uh, and what was your experience like? Um, I played Aubrey in the show. And, you know, I really enjoyed the experience. It kind of helped me learn more about, like, kids and what they go through. Because I never really knew that it was so, it could be so much more than what, you know, you actually saw. So it really helped, like show what it was all about, you know, and I'm really glad that I got the opportunity to see that. That's great, Brooklyn. Alexis, I, you know, I've seen you in this work really grow over the years, not only grow up, but also just grow in the work and really deepen your skills as an actress and a, and a, and a, and a, and a singer. Tell us a little bit about that, about your experience in developing your talents. Um, well, I've been a part of um, the Stand Up and Speak Out movement since the beginning when it was just a showcase. Um, and the experience of being in this, it, it becomes a family. And obviously our family has gone through a lot of changes. We performed at the Ivory Tin, the Kate um, from a showcase. Now we did the film and it's ever changing and growing and, and new people come into it. And it's just an amazing experience to be able to work with so many different people from so many different backgrounds and act with them and understand things that they went through while you know exploring the character that you're playing um in the film i played hope and that was so much fun she's such a, a quirky girl and she's um stephanie's best friend so in the film you kind of see her um you know be supportive but you don't really learn about her or anything that she's going through um and it's interesting to play that character and be able to create the backstory um, that's shown through her lines and um, and obviously her emotions towards Stephanie and towards the situations that are happening in the film. So it's been an amazing experience through the whole thing. And I am so excited for where we are right now and where it's gonna go. Thank you, Alexis. Juliana, you know, this work, uh, the work of learning how to communicate feelings, how to express them, uh, and also how to empathize and connect with others isn't always easy and it isn't always fun. Uh, sometimes they can, there can be difficult situations that bring us together that we have to work through, uh, not only with our peers, but also with trusted adults. So Juliana, can you tell us a little bit about who you played and also the, your experience in some of those dynamics? Yeah, so in the film and in the, the live production, I played Rhea the bully, one of the female bully. And um, when I actually, when I started in years ago in the beginning, I was just like a nice, a nice kid in the school. So from making that transition from being nice to being the bully of Stephanie, it's, it's definitely been an acting challenge um, because it, it breaks my heart having to say those mean things. But I learned like in the scenes with her family, with Rhea's family, like it helped me personally learn that you can't just say like, oh, that person's mean. Like they aren't always out to, out to get you. There could be stuff going on that you don't know about. And that's like, it really has opened my eyes playing that character because now in my personal life, I try to keep that in the back of my head, knowing that you don't always know what's going on 
So you have to be open-minded and always extend the helping hand like Stephanie does to Rhea in the end of the film. Thank you, Juliana. That's a powerful message because, you know, I, I you have to wonder uh, whether, and actually this is a question, Juliana, do you feel that what you just expressed, which is was very skillful, I think, and a good teaching lesson, do you feel that you were able to learn that through the production? Uh, were the, was there some enrichment that happened around the production for you? Tell us a little bit about that. Being a part of it, being like living in that character has definitely taught me like that lesson. But I feel like as a viewer as well, you can, like that's one of the key parts that we're trying to get across to the audience, especially to young people, that you have to, you have to look behind. You can't always judge up front. And I think that we've done a pretty good job expressing that throughout the whole film and the whole layout of it. So I hope we did. That's great, Juliana. Thank you. Lania, again, this is tough stuff. And, you know, sometimes you can't help as a viewer and as a consumer of this work, just really feel um, deeply for what's happening on the screen. You almost want to come through and help and, and be that uh, word of reassurance. Tell us a little bit about your process as an actress in really managing that emotional complexity that you display in the film and in the showcase. So I played the role of Stephanie and um, playing that role was a little tough um, as well. It's something that you have to adapt to and know, playing that character, knowing that she's very lonely and at first she doesn't really have that big support system that every person should have and you shouldn't have to suffer with the depression or just being sad. Um, it really opened my eyes and I hope that this film opened so many other young youthful eyes and it just helped me learn exactly what Juliana said that not everyone has this like perfect life as they may make it seem and there's always things behind their lives like they say never judge a book by its cover and that's exactly what we're trying to pursue here and show that there are little hidden things that factor out people that might make them want to bully others and make others feel the pain that they're feeling. Thank you, Linnea. That's, that's, um, that's really powerful. And it's powerful because it's in a lot of ways, you know, we describe selflessness. We describe that gift of giving of self to others, but even in selflessness, there's a connection and there's an empathy that's happening, which is so powerful. And, and we really appreciate that message. I think it does resonate in the film. And, you know, Jake, when I, when I think about uh, the, just that fun thread that is also one of the most expressive um, moments of caring, I think, in this production in the film, I think about your character. So tell us a little bit about your character and what that meant for you, Jake, and what that's done for you, not only as a, as a person, but also as an actor yourself. Sure. Oh my goodness. Being able to play Ian. It's, I think it's been five years that I've been playing Ian. It's been quite a long time. I, I always tell Jill, I remember when we were sitting out outside, we're all discussing how we're going to start this. And I said, now five years from now, look where we are. Like, look where the production has taken us. Look where the organization has taken us. Ian holds a, a huge place in my heart. I feel like I always wear my heart on, on my sleeve, just as Ian does as well. And I'm always there for my friends. I'm always caring. And Ian is the exact same way. Um, I could not be more proud and grateful for the amazing opportunities that I have received from Jill and through the organization. You know, we performed at the United Nations. Like, who could possibly say that they performed at the United Nations for, for a huge movement? That was incredible. As well as being able to perform for educators in the tri-state area, the Kate, um, Iverton Playhouse. I always mention this story because it touches me so much is after a show at Everton Playhouse, after the kids came and saw it, we were all outside thanking everyone for coming, and a young boy took my hand, and when he took my hand, he looked him in the eyes and said, thank you. And after he said that, my heart just melted, and I started to get teary-eyed because from, I can't remember how long the show runs, if it was probably like uh, maybe an hour-long show, Within an hour, I was able to touch somebody's life. 
And that meant so much to me. And it meant so much to me as a performer because the reason why that I'm involved in the arts is because I love the way of walking into a theater and then exiting a theater as two different people. So I think um, the arts are very powerful and music has been a huge outlet as well. Thank you, Jake. And I remember that moment actually, because it was that moment at the Ivertine Playhouse where we had wall to wall middle schoolers. And I had never seen a group of middle schoolers so enraptured in a moment. And it was the moment of seeing their older peers on that stage. And one of the things that has been really interesting in the state of Connecticut in the live production uh, is going to the different schools and seeing the different ways in which young people have responded to this production. And almost to the school, the kids are absolutely engaged. And why is that? You know, the actors are just a couple of years older than the kids. So they see themselves in the production. But also, um, I'm recalling the experience of, of Meriden under the directorship of then uh, uh, Assistant Superintendent Miguel Cardona, who is now the Commissioner of Education. And he very graciously partnered with us to actually do an American Idol style audition uh, for young people to take place in the product, take uh, part in the production in Meriden. So, it, you know, there's a what's great about this production is that there are various levels at which a school can engage it. You know, you can do the light touch, which is having uh, actors such as these come to your school, do the production, and then we give you for free an enrichment guide that you can use uh, for um, following up on some of the things that the kids experienced and saw. But another way to experience this is that actually you can put this play on at your own school. Uh, part of the resources that we're going to be releasing on our website uh, come this Friday will be a Zoom version of this work and a virtual enrichment guide, because we know now that a lot of us are having to empathize and connect over two-dimensional media. But one thing that is really powerful is that while we may not be able to have the benefit of all of our senses when we're in a space like this together, the one sense that always resonates and cuts all the way through is that sense of empathy and that sense of heart. So I, I really want to thank you, um, Jake, for reminding us of that. Um, and finally, uh, Saban, am I pronouncing your name right, Saban? Sorry, yeah, it's, it's Saban. Great, awesome. Saban, you know, so much of this uh, in this work is about enrichment and about having the tools and the, the building blocks around a production like this to actually improve uh, yourself as a person and improve your toolbox, build on your toolbox of how it is that you can center, that you can communicate, that you can relate. So tell us a little bit about your process and being part of the enrichment activities and the creation and really development of these enrichment activities together with Robin. Um, it's been, it's been a, it's like a character development for me, really. I've learned so much from Robin and I can't thank her enough on all the things that, like, I'm just glad that I met her at a younger age where the ideas that she told me could resonate with me and they really did help me throughout my life. Actually just, um, keeping myself in a good mental state because you are going to, you're always going to run into, you know, bad people who are going to be very rude to you, but you have to think of how much they're hurting for them to do that to you. And um, just to stay calm. Right. And Robin has helped me a lot with that. Salvin, that's a, that's a beautiful message. And you know, I want to, I want to, first of all, thank you. And I want to thank you for shouting out Robin there. It's funny because, you know, from in my culture, we have godparents for everything. And uh, that's what we call them. They're people who care about you, help support you throughout your life. And uh, so there are two Robins that come to mind in this work that are kind of like the godmothers of, of this work, two of them anyway. One of them, of course, is Robin Fox, who you've met here tonight. And the other is Robin Stern from the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. I want to give out a shout out to Robin Stern because she uh, really does embody this work. And so much of what you describe, Saman, in, you know, those 
you're, you're grateful for having met someone who can impart some of their wisdom uh, early enough in your life so that it makes a difference. Well, I'll tell you, I'm a little bit later on in my life and it's still making a difference. So to the two Robins, to Jill and to the others on the, and to Eileen, I just wanna thank you as well and just give you another shout out for the work that you continue to do as educators, as empaths and people who, who really get this stuff. I wanna do one more round with our young people before I move to our adult, uh, the adult in the panel. Um, and first, I'm going to start with you, Jake, because I know you have something to say. Uh, but I wa also want to ask you a question. If there's anything, you know that right now we're, we're on Facebook Live. This broadcast is going to be rebroadcast on CTN, on Connecticut Television. And there'll be opportunities for you to forward this uh, um, information to your friends. You know that there are people hurting out there, people that are your age, perhaps a little younger, maybe a little older. If there's anything that you want to say to them, uh, whether they are experiencing loss or grief or um, some other type of pain or despair, that you can share some words of encouragement, some words of, of grace, I would, I would invite you to do that. Uh, Jake, go right ahead. Sure. So being a college student and being home during quarantine and then all of a sudden you know, I have an apartment in New York City and my parents kind of just dropping me off and like, all right, we'll see you soon. And I'm like, whoa, like I'm here by myself in New York City. Um, I know a lot of my friends who have been struggling with mental health and, you know, I'm going to own up to it as well. Like I have been also struggling with, you know, my mental health as well. And what I have been doing recently is I put in my phone, in my reminders, positive quotes that release at a certain time of the day where I know I don't want to say it's my weakest point, but it's a point that I know I could use use a boost. So I could read off some of the, the quotes that I have on here. Um, I have this one from Dear Evan Hansen. Today is going to be a good day, and here's why. Because today, at least you're you, and that's enough. I have every version of you is good enough. Yes, even this one. Those are just two of many that I have. And one that I personally always go by is this too shall pass. It's only temporary. You know, we can't dwell. The world only moves forward and we can't dwell on the past. You just got to keep your keep your head up and keep on going. That's a beautiful message. Thank you, Jake. Alexis. Yes. <laughs> so if there's something that you would share with a peer uh, somewhere who may be watching, who may be listening, what would you share with them today? Oh, wow. There's a lot I could say, but honestly, I think the biggest thing is to allow yourself to feel in the moment and not to push it down. You're not weak for feeling, you're not weak for crying, and you're absolutely not weak for asking for help. Um, so I would say you need to just allow yourself to feel. Let it out and ask for help because a lot of people are struggling right now and a lot of people have been through similar things. And even if you ask for help for someone, the help that you might be receiving from them might help them as well. We're all in this together and you just need to allow yourself to feel, trust yourself and know that one day it'll get better because everything happens for a reason. Thank you, Alexis. Juliana, same question. So the quote that sticks with me most is actually from the show and it's no one is too broken to be fixed. And that I, I've been keeping in my head and I would love to share with anyone who needs to hear it because I know we've, we've all been through a lot, especially this year with everything going on. And it's been hard for some people. We've all had, had grief and experienced pain and it's, there's been tough times and different struggles that many of us haven't experienced before, especially the younger people. And I just like a reminder that everything will get better. Like, like my peers were saying, um, and no one is too broken to be fixed and we're all here and there's a support system for you if you don't feel that you have. Thank you, Juliana. That's really powerful. Lania. I would definitely say to keep your head up and keep it high or as 
like you're way stronger than what you may think you are. Even in the song, Bring On Tomorrow, and she's like, I'm stronger now. My voice has been found. Bring on tomorrow. It's like, bring on the new day, the new light, everything, just happiness and try to keep your head up and push through everything that may be hard for you at the moment. But as long as you find friends or a good support system to help you get through it, you can definitely bring on tomorrow. Thank you, Linnea. And finally, Saban. Um, I wanna just um, remind people that everybody has faced a sort of trauma in their life and whatever you may be going through, just know for a fact that somebody else has felt this exact thing before. And you can always reach out to somebody. Everybody has felt this pain before. And everybody has something to say that will help. And um don't let yourself come down from you know small things whether it be people or stress from homework or whatever it is just don't let it bring you down right because when life gives you lemon you make lemonades right so yeah don't let anything bring you down thank you thank you so much you know one thing i can i can assure you uh i have watched this production and this showcase and various forms of it many many times and every single time I experience what you described, Jake, which is I came into the theater, uh, one person, and I leave a different person. And that happens because of people like you, people who are willing to commit to this work, each and every one of you, uh, who are willing to be empathic and vulnerable. And these are skills. These are valuable skills that not only you have learned and are developing, but that you're also modeling for other people in the state of Connecticut of every age. So I, again, want to take this opportunity to thank you as artists, thank you as people, and, and really uh, to encourage you to continue to connect and, and emote uh, throughout your lives, because you really are part of life-saving and life-changing work. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Now we're gonna move on to our final panel, which is our responsive panel uh, of um, people who've been uh, uh, oh, with the adults, people who've been around the sun a few more times than, the, than our young people. So welcome back to the adults. Um, I'd like to first welcome uh, Dr. Sal Menzo, who is the superintendent of Wallingford Public Schools. Uh, I'll welcome back Eileen and Robin as well. Uh, and also, uh, Sal, you have a team of friends with you who I know that you will introduce and help uh, and help sort of orchestrate the conversation with me, if you will. Uh, I also would like to welcome Denise Drummond, who is a legislative policy person here at the staff, my colleague, Denise, and my colleague, Melvette Hill, who is our statewide director of the Parent Leadership Training Institute. Hi, Melvette. And, and finally, uh, David Adams, if you're still there, we'd like to welcome you back uh, just to weigh in and, and be a friend as we have uh, these conversations. But firstly, Dr. Sal Menzo, you know, I have described you as one of the most innovative, thoughtful, empathic leaders in the state. And the reason I do that is because you have a way of really seeing the way these things work, but also more importantly, the way they work together. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your intentionality and how it is that you bring in social emotional skills development in all of the work that you do in the environment of teaching and learning. Sure. Before I begin, though, thank you for having me and thank you for those kind words. But I really am, unfortunately, it's that the adults have to follow the students because you were amazing. Um, I, I have to say administrators and teachers and educators are having really a tough time right now. And so are students. You were the highlight of, if not this week, this month. Um, thank you so very, very much. Um, your passion, your sentiment is just incredible. And your words of wisdom, I, I wrote some of those down because I need those too. Um, so thank you so very, very much. I, I'm just so inspired by all of you. Um, in Wallingford, um, having been there now 12 years as superintendent, uh, I think our focus is really looking at social emotional learning, not just for our students, but also all of aspects of our community. And I think that's really what we, we try to do is make it embedded within all that we do with our students, our staff, our parents, and our community at large. Um, we have, over the last several years, we've embarked upon uh, an initiative called Eat, Play, and Unplug. And Steve, you were part of the inception of that. 
uh, where we really try to get people in the community throughout the whole community to really take care of themselves. Um, and in doing so, hopefully become a better you and a better member of a community and a better partner in a community. Um, and in doing so also focusing on kindness and focusing on empathy. Um, our schools are, are very integrated in terms of resourcing um, different opportunities for students uh, in the area of social emotional learning. But really now with COVID and I have my team here with me, part of my team, uh, Kristen Valero, who's uh, principal of Pond Hill Elementary School. I have uh, Todd Snyder, who's our principal of Dag Hammarskjöld Middle School, and Tony Loomis, who's our wellness coordinator. Um, we really want to make an effort, especially in these times. We know that these difficulties that students are experiencing, adults are experiencing in our community have always been there. But now with COVID um, and the new reality, this two-dimensional reality, as Steve mentioned, of learning in many instances has really impacted everyone even greater. So we see the, the stand up, um, you know, speak out movement as really important for us. Um, and we look forward to, you know, integrating the video and we're, we want to, or the movie rather, we want to start it with our teachers. Uh, we feel that this is important and we want to hear what their worries and wonderings are. Um, we want to hear what our parents' worries and wonderings are. Um, and then of course our students, because we see it as uh, a three-legged stool that needs to be able to stand together and stand strong. So we've had a history in Wallingford um, of doing uh, a lot of great things with many, many layers of our staff in this area, but we see this as a perfect opportunity and we are so pleased to uh, come to uh, this understanding um, and be part of this. But um, I won't go on into great, great detail of what we're doing because um, I, I don't wanna take up too much time but I, I do know that we're very excited and we do see it. We, we have to see social emotional, social emotional learning as part of what we're doing, not an add on. We can't continue to add things to people's plates, be it a student's curriculum or a teacher's you know, repertoire that they have to teach or a parent's responsibility or a community responsibility. We have to see it as something that is just one of those essential ingredients in whatever you love to eat. Um, you know, whatever that food is that makes you happy, um, we want social emotional learning to be part of that food um, and feed you as a person to help be able to um, really nourish and, and uh, foster positive relationships within our community. Thank you, Sal. I know a couple of members of your team are here and I'll, I'll let them collect their thoughts, but I, I really encourage you to to chime in. But I want to turn to our parents for a little bit who are they, they are parents who are my colleagues who happen to be parents, uh, or one, one way or the other. But I'd like to welcome, firstly, uh, Melvette Hill. Melvette, you are, um, uh, to my mind, uh, one, of the, one of our premier leaders in parent leadership in the state of Connecticut. And so much of this work is about engagement, and it's multi-generational as well. Uh, tell us a little bit about why this work is important for you as a professional that does the work that you do, but also as a parent. Hi, Steve. Thank you so much. Um, I would say that, you know, when we look at the arts and, and the, the capacity of arts, whether it's in school or in community, the arts give us an opportunity to feel and to heal. Right. And in some cases, people don't even understand that they're not feeling at all until they arrive at a theater or they engage in you know, music or some form of art. Uh, arts allow us to express ourselves. And, um, and you know, in PLTI and our Parent Leadership Training Institute, we really um, help people to understand how things work in community how things work in our democracy, how they can engage, as well as how we can make our communities better for our children. And one of the things we talk a lot about is intellect over emotion. Now, before you put the brakes on, this is a curriculum that was developed over 25 years ago. We also know now, maybe a better term to say is intellect together with emotion, everything working together, right? And so that's something that's so important for parents and children um, and you know, young people like yourselves on, on the uh, Zoom today. I am so excited to be in this space with you as you express yourselves and as you draw us into your own personal experiences. So I believe that in order to make our democracy better, right? Um, in order to continue to allow people to connect 
on deeper levels, um, that people aren't isolated and that we're not in this sense of separating ourselves and, and getting wrapped up in polarization. When we look at how we're feeling and we're able to express that in safe places, we learn to trust each other. Right? And when we learn to trust and we can start working together. So I think that's how it all fits together, Stephen. I, I feel that way as a parent of four young adults myself, as well as someone who's engaged in uh, civic engagement, um, both on the state and federal level. So I think this is something that is just the, the very beginnings of something more powerful than we can ever imagine. Thank you, Melvet. Uh, before I before I turn to Denise, David, you know, to feel and to heal. You described a powerful moment in your own experience uh, where you felt and healed in that moment. Uh, but tell us, how does what Melvet said was really um, compelling? In that she described the importance of this work to the civic fabric as well. So tell us a little bit about your thoughts about the the important relationship between social and emotional skills building and civics. Thank you, Stephen, and thank, thank you, uh, Malbec, for introducing that concept. Um, we know that uh, the, the notion, the, the grounding of civics is being in community with each other. Um, and there's a lot of ways to be in community with each other, but you can only be in community with those you experience, right? And so um, activating social emotional skills, active listening, perspective taking allows us uh, to be in relationship with each other, to experience each other. Um, and, and opportunities like the art create that fabric, right? It creates that, that uh, the comfort that allows us to actually pull it over each other and say, this is a common thing we all experienced. Um, not everybody wants to sit in a circle and talk about their feelings, um, but listening to a song that, that really resonates is a way to kind of move us into that same place. And you know, we talked about before, um, being able to be in a synergy we're all sharing the same emotion um, at the same place in the same time. So uh, in order for us to move beyond some of the polarization that Melvet talked about, uh, we'll need to create a narrative and the arts are gonna be so important for helping us to create that narrative, uh, whether it's through literature, whether it's through song, whether it's through play or a combination of the three, for example, like Hamilton. Um, it's that reimagining that's gonna move us forward as a nation and it's gonna be our SEL skills that allow us to get there. David, thank you, thank you so much, um, and thank you so much for referencing Hamilton. It's one of the one of the examples of you know a, a refreshed view of the founding, which really allowed each of us to see ourselves in that founding. You know, uh, really observing the founding, not agnostically understanding the context in which it occurred, but also daring us to imagine it with us in it. So thank you for that, David. Uh, Denise, you know, not only is Denise Drummond our web guru uh, at the commission who has been able to put together these materials that we will be releasing on Friday in a, in a nice and accessible way. Uh, thank you, Denise, for doing that. Uh, but also you're a parent. Uh, uh, so tell us a little bit about this work, how it relates to your experience and why it's important to you. Well, I'm a you know, mom and I'm also an advocate for people with disabilities. And my advocacy work has primarily focused on children that are on the higher end of the autism spectrum. So all this talk about social emotional learning is just, I mean, I just think it's, it's wonderful. Um, kids that are on the high end of the autism spectrum, these kids um, can't, they have what I call an invisible disability because you can't look at them and tell that they have a disability. Um, you know, they look like their typical peers. So they often go undiagnosed and they're often um, easy targets for bullying. Um, during the middle school years is when, you know, they really start to um, recognize that, that they don't fit in, that they're different, you know, and they don't know why, they just know that they don't. Um, so then, you know, a lot of times these kids will, some of them will act out, some of them will begin to isolate themselves. Um, so I really appreciate social emotional learning because SEL, it teaches um, kids the how and the why of social behaviors. And it also helps um, them to develop an awareness and an understanding of their, their own emotions. And it, um, you know, it, it um, allows them to express what it is they're feeling. And um, it gives them the strategies um, that work for them. And then, you know, the exercise that we just did with Robin, I just thought that was great because 
kids on the spectrum, you know, a lot of them, they can't differentiate between, you know, like when someone's teasing or when someone's joking. And so one of the questions was, um, you know, I can tell when someone's teasing, you know, or when they're being serious or not. But kids on the spectrum, they can't differentiate that. So, you know, I just think this is like, you know, in, in a setting like that, you have, you have the, the opportunity um, for the instructor to um, to teach about these feelings, to help them understand, and also to um, help students develop an appreciation and respect for others and experiences that, um, that others are, are experiencing. So I just think that this is wonderful, and I'm so glad that it's going to be available to all um, middle school and high school students in Connecticut. So I'm just really excited. Thank you, Miss. Thank you, Miss Truman. Um, and thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you know, it's so powerful when not only do we get to experience the work, but we get to live it as well. And that's that's one of the amazing things of being able to work together uh, in this commission and the things that we do together. So thank you for all that you do. Um, you know, what's I'll tell you, Robin Fox, uh, Denise reminds me of how it is that you and I met. Uh, early on, we we met uh, working and me really getting to learn about your work uh, in improv and working with with young people on the autism spectrum. Tell us a little bit about uh, your background and some of the work that you have done in using the arts to help people connect. Well, it was uh, my last couple of years of teaching as a special educator in Region 13 when I was uh, had a group of kids who I was working with on social emotional learning skills and they were high they were um, you know low needs autistic kids and they had um, a really good understanding of everything they were supposed to do if I gave them a paper and pencil test about social nuances they would get an A however <laughs> they'd walk in the cafeteria and be uh, very um, oblivious of all the messages that were coming at them really fast. And we were sitting, uh, I was you know, charged with doing this and I'm also a professional improv actor. And I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna play a game with them. Just, you know, they're suffering right now. <laughs> so I played a simple game of pass the clap where I turned to one student and I clapped with them and they turned to the next student and they clapped at the same time. So they had to time it and believe it or not, when we were done, they said, do you know any more games? This is really fun. And honestly, my head almost exploded because I realized that the principles of improv, these exercises teach you to be present, to notice very uh, you know, nuanced uh, communication. And when you are having fun learning how to do that because the exercise or game depends on that, then you're in. And you. Uh, so I developed a whole curriculum around it for kids um, on the spectrum and have been, um, you know, had the great fortune of having so many, um, I've in, in my life started out my career working with um, autistic uh, teens and carried that through my career. And it wasn't until I put the improv together with cognitive awareness, thinking about your thinking and then mindfulness, observing your thinking that it just became so clear to me that when we are uh, you know, playful with each other and can pick up on you know, the communication and we don't take it personally and we just know that um, how, how to build self-esteem because there are steps to build self-esteem and we can teach these things to kids. And I've seen kids, some of my friends who are now adults on the spectrum and Steve, uh, was a, on a panel where we had some of these adults uh, who are advocates and um, you know really promoting their viewpoint, which is so important to hear, right? And um, it just is amazing when we can really listen to each other, learn the value of what comes out of each and every human being. There's some treasure that is there. And social emotional learning helps us to get there. And so. Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much. And, and I love your work and I love that work because 
it's it's really it's critically important, I think, for families who may be watching now, uh, who either have uh, uh, neuroatypical children or children who are experiencing difficult times in one way or another, uh, to know that there's somewhere that they can turn, that there are skills that they can access. That is so powerful, and it and it's it's in hope engendering. So thank you so much, Robin, for that. You know. Um, uh, Sal, I want to give you an opportunity to to put somebody on your team on the spot, if you so choose, um, just because I know uh, uh, Todd um, uh, and, and Kristen and, and Tony, having been a, a consumer of what you do by, and an admirer of what you do, I'm just really grateful that you're here with us today. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I, I would suggest that, um, and, and I'm going to do this to him, but I know that He's prepared for this. Mr. Loomis, um, you know, share a little bit as the health and wellness uh, coordinator for the district, you know, a little bit about our passion towards this project and bringing the arts uh, into the conversation about SCL. Sure. Um, <clears throat> a lot of educators um, talk about Bloom's taxonomy. Bloom's taxonomy is a hierarchy of uh, critical thinking, starting from easier things like identifying up to creating. And um, especially now in this, this pandemic that we're in, a lot of educators, a lot of teachers feel like there's no time for anything extra. We have to um, just go with the basics. We've got to just teach the content and that's it. Um, the problem with that is we have to address Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We have to address um, the well-being of our students, the social emotional needs of our students. Um, and the saying goes, it's not my saying, I wish it was, but um, kids got a Maslow before they can bloom. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do in, in Wallingford is address, um, address those, those vital important needs and make sure every kid is feeling safe and um, is feeling comfortable. We've got uh, many different programs the building administrators, the teachers, we are all working hard in Wallingford to try to address the mental health of our students. Um, and whether, it's, whether it be feeling overwhelmed from, um, again, the environment that we're in, or whether it be stress from bullying, um, seeing an uptick in, in cyberbullying, um, that's our priority right now. And, and we know that um, we have to address this. We have to hit this head on. And what we love about this program and why we're involved in Wallingford Public Schools is because the adults in a school only see about 14% or so of bullying incidences. Um, we see a small fraction of that. And it's vital for the students to take it upon themselves to look out for one, uh, one another because they are the ones that are in it. They're the ones that are seeing it a lot more than we are. And we can only do so much. And so um, we, we really uh, commend the students and um, Robin and Jill and, and Steve, um, everybody, um, thank you. And, and we're looking uh, very much so forward to implementing these, these films in the online format and making it a, a part of the fabric of, of what we're doing in Wallingford. Thank you, Tony. Todd, I saw you on mute earlier. You know, if you could just remind our audience the, the level at which um, of, of students that you work with. Sure. It's a real honor uh, to be here. First to our student actors, you guys were terrific. Uh, I watched the film uh, a couple of weeks ago and just phenomenal. I really, uh, I applaud you all. It's truly a gift uh, to the state of Connecticut and beyond. Um, I'm intrigued with the idea of the possibility of, of our students performing something like this too. Uh, our students right now, uh, we're, we're on a hybrid model and I do think that, that they're, uh, they're telling uh, the adults that there are times when they want to express themselves either in written form or, or just putting on some kind of a, a performance. So I'm intrigued by that idea. But, um, you know, as I'm listening to this, I'm, uh, I can't remember where I heard the quote, but life is lived forward but it's understood backwards. And I don't know if that's a blessing or a curse, uh, but we all go through that. And I think it's our job, our obligation to our students, to the families, um, to show them that way. You know, academics is obviously a priority, um, but it's those lessons within the lessons. And uh, we're really looking forward to rolling this out. Uh, I met with uh, a group of adults today uh, on staff and uh, told them about this. And 
how we want to continue uh, the program and the momentum that we've done as a district. So uh, this has been great and I'm uh, just honored and humbled to be with all of you. So thank you. Thank you, Todd. I love that because your inspiration to, to see, to want to see your young people expressing themselves in this way, I think is spot on. And that's what this work allows for. So thank you for saying that. Kristen. So thank you all for having us tonight. Um, the young people that are on here tonight, you've inspired me to do things um, starting tomorrow. Uh, we do play music for our kids on Fridays and they kind of have a dance party as they go down the hall. Um, I think we need to do more of that because it starts with the adults. And when the adults are exhibiting positive behavior, um, it translates over. Uh, in addition, uh, Jake, you talked about quotes. Um, I am ready to go. They're gonna start in our morning announcements. So we have a quote for the year that we are a rainbow of possibilities um, in our building. That's kind of our, our theme. Um, but I think having those reminders every day, maybe at various parts of the day when, you know, that afternoon slump, maybe to lift, lift everybody back up um, is, are some of the things that I can't wait to do um, with staff and students right away. So I thank you for that. Um, it's really nice to hear from kids that are that have lived it recently and that are living it now um, in schools every day because as Tony said, we only see a small fraction. Um, and the more that we can do to support that social emotional well-being of our adults and our kids, um, the better off we're gonna be. So thank you again. And thank you for the inspiration. I can't wait to get started. Thank you, Kristen. Jill, Jill Nessie, so you started this. Um, and, and let me tell you what, what this is, to my mind. What this is, is that your energy and your, um, your generosity has really caused people of all different walks of life and disciplines to come together around a concept. The concept that through the arts, we can learn to connect better and get to know each other better and maybe do a better job together. Um, so Jill, you know, I know you're a visionary. If you were to look five years down the road, where do you see this work heading? Oh my goodness. Um, well, hopefully it will be all over the country and all over the world, helping children and helping adults as well who teach the children, um, you know, with various forms of, of art, empathy and connection. Thank you, Jill, so much. You know, when I, you know, there, there are young people watching now and I, and I wanna remind everyone who's watching that it all started with a song and a lot of heart. And that's what you brought to us, Jill. And again, I wanna thank you for that because uh, you're, you've continued to bring us all together in ways that are dynamic and that are really um, a benefit to the people of the state of Connecticut and beyond. So thank you so much, Jill. Uh, for all of your artistry uh, and for continuing to work with us on our project, uh, Empathy and Connection Through the Arts. Uh, be on the lookout on Friday. We're going to be releasing our web uh, on our website at the commission a special page that's devoted to this work that will include some of the tools and enrichment activities that we discussed. I want to give one more thanks to each and every one of you, uh, including our very special guest, David Adams, uh, and Sal Menzo and your team, um, and of course, our panel of learned young people who are walking the walk uh, and talking the talk, however it is that that goes. But <laughs> I really wanna thank you. Um, you are, again, committing a public service for the people of the state of Connecticut. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Thank you for being with us tonight. And let's do this again sometime. <laughs>